This week on Maker Update, a self-driving garbage can, flat pack furniture, multi-material goes lenticular, a slack dial, animated origami, cassette sound sculpture, and nailing the mill spec look. Hey, I'm Donald Bell, and welcome back to another Maker Update, the show where I update you on what makers are up to. That's the tagline. I think it's all right. Uh, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well. I've got a great show for you. I know I talk up each week's show, but I swear this week's show is really something special. It's a little longer than usual, but man, it is weeks like this that remind me why I love putting the show together. Uh, so let's get right into it, starting with the project of the week. Ahad Cove made this self-driving garbage can that automatically drives itself out to the curb on garbage day. It's one of those ideas that sounds deceptively simple, but to truly make everything automatic, you have to solve a lot of problems along the way. To motorize the trash can, Ahad's using a brushless hub wheel motor, an inexpensive driver board, all connected up to a Raspberry Pi computer and a rechargeable battery pack. All of this gets installed in the bottom of the trash can. But that's the relatively easy part. To deliver the garbage to the curb just in time, he needed a way to detect when the garbage truck was approaching and then signal his garage door to open and then signal the bin to move out to the curb. To solve this problem, he trained a machine learning algorithm to detect garbage trucks from a webcam mounted in an upstairs window. This system uses an NVIDIA Jetson Xavier board so that the detection can happen as quickly as possible. After detecting the truck, it signals the Wi-Fi compatible garage door to open, waits the required amount of time, and then signals the pie in the trash bin to run the motor for the length of the driveway, and then activates a high torque servo that pulls the motor brake. It's complicated, but when he gets it to work, it's a great feeling. I don't think I hate taking out the trash enough to go to this length to automate things, but I love knowing that it's possible, and I get such a thrill seeing the engineering challenges get solved. Now for some news, designer Ben Ueda of Homemade Modern is teaming up with AO5 Studio to release a new sustainable furniture brand called Hoke Home. What they've been teasing so far is a line of tool-free flat pack furniture. In a series of Instagram videos, you can see how the HDPE plastic legs chip in these fitted pockets that are built into the underside of the table. All you have to do is pull them out and snap them into place. By squeezing the leg, you can also remove it and store it back in its little cutout. It's apparently a patented system, but I think it's an awesome idea to put into your own personal use, especially if you have a CNC router. Another technique I'm dying to explore is this lenticular 3D printing effect shown here in the work of Gianni Zhang and Hong Zhaodeng. This work recently won a Core 77 Design Award in Strategy and Research. When you think of a lenticular effect, it's usually something to do with creating 3D or animated images. The idea is essentially that clear raised lines with a particular shape can bend light to a degree that the image or color beneath it can be revealed or obscured depending on the angle you view it. To pull this off as a 3D printing technique, you apparently need to make use of multi-material printing technology, though there's an example in this video reel of 3D printed lollipop candy molds, which in my mind could be done with traditional 3D printing. Either way, it's an exciting technique to think about and the effect opens up some cool design possibilities. Now for more projects, Becky Stern teamed up with Brian Locke to create this physical status updater for Slack. Now, if you're away from your desk or eating lunch or walking the dog, you can just set the dial without having to go into the software. The project uses a rotary switch and a Node MCU board so that it can connect to Wi-Fi. The rest of it comes down to just a 3D printed enclosure and printing up a little label for the different states that you define in the code. Because of this project, there's a new Slack API library for Arduino now, so if you have other Slack-related project ideas, this could open those up. You can find the full guide on Instructables. While reading up on the lenticular 3D printing technique, I stumbled across this other project that Gianni Zhang collaborated on. This is a crawling robot called Mollusca. Its body is made from a sandwich of two sheets of vellum paper and a layer of double-tack adhesive film. The whole thing is then laser etched with an origami inspired folding pattern and then folded into shape. Two servos along the spine act as pulleys that create a kind of pulsing motion that drives it around. For a similar idea at a smaller, more approachable scale, check out this experiment from Federico Taban. Inspired by some of the 3D printed origami experiments I made last November, this is a 3D printed pattern on polyester fabric. Noticing that the shifting design has some mechanical properties 
Federico designed in a slot for a paperclip crank and turned it into a kind of origami automata. You can find his build diary on Patreon and the 3D printed design on Prusa. For another project with that I can't believe it's 3D printed vibe, check out this military inspired Raspberry Pi cyber deck by Jay Dosher at Back7. Jay's done a bunch of awesome pie field kit designs worth checking out, but this is a whole new approach that he's showing here. First, there's the military green PETG filament that he found, which just looks perfect for a project like this. He's also using threaded brass heat set inserts to connect a lot of these parts together. Not only does this allow you to repair and modify things later on, but it gives the face of it a cool riveted look. It also allows you to put a textured build plate finish on more of the pieces because you can print them all separately and attach them later. So much of this looks injection molded because you're seeing the build plate texture on everything. Finally, notice how he creates these fins on the back using separately printed sections that he binds together with threaded rod. Not only does this give it some metal reinforcement, but again, it allows him to take advantage of build plate texture, at least on one side of each fin. I also just have to mention that Jay designed all of this and all of his other amazing designs using Tinkercad. So for all of you CAD snobs out there who say you can't make complex designs in Tinkercad, I'm telling you, the only limits are your imagination and ingenuity. Designer Love Holton has plenty of both. His latest project offered without explanation is this pitch control cassette player he calls the MCP. The top dial controls both the playback speed and thereby the pitch of the cassette player as well as the rotation speed of this wind up key looking thing next to it. This might actually be like a Leslie organ style rotating speaker design, but I can't be sure just from the video. The box next to that just appears to be a box of blinky lights and I have to presume the other dial on the cassette deck is volume? Who knows why this crazy thing came into existence, but do I want to play with it? Absolutely. And like all of Love's work, I'm in awe at the level of thought that goes into the finishes and the details, the dreamy retro color scheme, the custom coiled audio cable. It's a work of art. Now for some tips and tools. On Hackspace, there's a great article on the types of inexpensive DC to DC variable power supply boards you can get your hands on and how to use them. These come in handy when you have a few different elements in a project that have different voltage needs. I've used them on Pi Robotics projects where I have 12 volts coming in to power the motors, but I need 5.1 volts to keep my Raspberry Pi happy. On some basic models, you can dial in the voltage using a tiny built-in potentiometer and reading the result with a multimeter. For a few dollars more, you can find these with a built-in voltage display or a separate trim pot for dialing in the amperage. On the Cool Tools channel, I've got another interview up with Matt Stoltz talking about the Big Idea Design Titanium Pocket Bit. This is a two-sided bit that fits right onto your keyring. It's super minimal, but it's also super strong because it's made from titanium. Check out the video for more information. In the latest issue of Gareth Brandwin's Tips, Tools, and Shop Tales newsletter, reader David L. sent in a great tip on sorting and storing sheets of sandpaper in a portfolio-style accordion file. I'm totally doing this one. And from the Adafruit blog, I found this folding model paint rack from Fide. This holds 25 millimeter bottles of paint and it can fold down flat or prop up at an angle with a little geared leg. Thought it was neat. Finally, for this week's DigiKey Spotlight, check out this video on how to safely discharge a capacitor. This is especially useful when you're working on equipment with large capacitors that can store a potentially deadly amount of charge. In this video, you'll learn how to measure the stored voltage on a capacitor and how to select the right resistor value to safely bleed off the excess voltage. As an alternative, you'll also learn how to drain a capacitor using an incandescent bulb with a voltage rating higher than the capacitor. That was a new one for me. All right, and that does it for this week's show. Am I crazy or were the projects in this episode just extra awesome? Let me know what your favorite project was down in the comments. You can also subscribe, leave a thumbs up, get on the Maker Update email list so you never miss an extra awesome show like this. And uh, big thanks to my patrons on Patreon and social distance. High five to DigiKey Electronics for being so cool and for making this show possible. All right. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.